that you know that you know that you know that you know that there is power in the name of Jesus. You have witnessed using the name of Jesus and seen the power of God move in your own individual lives and other lives. The enemy would have us think that there's no more power. Oh, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Jesus said that. Hallelujah. We're not losing, people of God. We're not losing. Get a different picture in your mind. The enemy would have you have a different picture that you're losing. But remember, he's a liar. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus.
favor Receive it upon Yeah A thousand generations Yeah Your family Yeah, you're singing your children, beautiful Shout it out, yeah she's still playing if you could just bow before the Lord the presence of God he's very 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 present in the midst of his brethren amen in the midst of the congregation just bow true worship true worship walking in the midst of his people. He's telling you. are present, but that Jesus is present. They long to know. They can't know redemption. They don't know redemption. Jesus, our Redeemer. Our Redeemer.
when you have finished receiving, just thank Him. Begin to thank Him. For we walk by faith and not by sight. He promised to be in the midst of His people. He's blessing. He's blessing. He's blessing. He's blessing. He's healing. He's healing. Thank you, Lord. Before I begin, I love to be up here and tell you something's going to be a real good, feel-good message. Do you know what I mean? I'm going to warn you, it isn't. It may not be. I'm going to begin out of the book of Jude. I felt like that's where the Lord led me, to Jude. It's the book before the very last revelation. Jude calls himself a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. James and Jude are Mary and Joseph's other children, some of them, okay? And so he didn't even call himself the brother of Jesus. He said he was a servant of him. He knew he needed to receive him as Lord and Savior. And so there's only 25 verses, and I read quick. I think I can. I'm going to read uh, through it using the New King James, and then I'll go from there. Verse 1. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ. Mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which once for all was delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. But I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their pro proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. As Sodom and Gomorrah, as the cities around them, in a similar Similar manner to these having given themselves over to sexual immorality and going after strange flesh are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise, also, these dreamers defile the flesh. They reject authority. They speak evil of dignitaries. Yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling ac accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these speak evil whatever they do not know, and whatever they know naturally, like brute beast. In these things they corrupt themselves. Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, have run greedily in the era of Balaam for profit, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. These are spots in your love feast, while they feast with you without fear. Serving only themselves, they are clouds without water, carried about by the winds like autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame, wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against them. Have you got it's ungodly? These are grumblers, they're complainers, walking around in their own lust, and they mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lust. These sensual persons who cause divisions, not having the spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourself in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And on some have compassion, making a distinction, but others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. Now unto him who is able 
to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God our Savior who alone is wise be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forever. Amen. Amen. That is the word from Jude. Father, I ask that you have your way this morning. I pray that um, your people will hear your heart and your compassion and that we are blessed and you are for us. You love us so much that you sent Jesus for us to take our place and die on Calvary, Lord. And I thank you for that and give you praise and honor in Jesus' name. Before I begin, I forgot to tell you that tonight, Pastor Jerry will be here. He will be here, and he will be uh, serving a communion, our communion tonight, okay? So do come back. All right. Jude believed, he, I, if you look at the verse 3, he was the one to be, uh, make haste and be diligent about writing uh, about the common uh, salvation that we all have in Christ Jesus. Maybe he was going to, you know, how exciting it was or, or this thing. But then I believe that the Holy Spirit changed his focus, and he said, but I must exhort you to contend earnestly for the faith. I found that the word contend means to struggle or engage in a conflict to overcome. Earnestly is with great passion. And so we, he believed that the foundational things of Christianity uh, were being attacked, and they were under attack, and we, we're in a war. And so we're contend for the faith means we get in someone's faith, face and yell and scream at them at how wrong they are, correct? Uh, yeah, no, I heard. We are in a battle, but our weapons are not carnal, not fleshly, but they're mighty to the pulling down of God. And we're going to kind of talk about some of that as we go through all this. But, you know, this is what 2 Timothy 2, 24 and 25, and I think I forgot to give it to you, Vicki. The Lord's servant must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient. I like to mark that one out. <laughs> in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. So I don't get in their face and yell and scream and tell them how awful they are. I don't uh, take my Bible, my big thick Bible, and pound them over the head or up the side of the head and tell them how wrong. I don't take the sword of the Spirit and poke them with them till they're out the door and we got rid of them. That's not what Jude even tells us to do. But he tells us to contend for the faith. And if there's any time in our history, in the 21st century, it is time for the church, the army of God, to rise up and contend for the faith. We must. We must. But there's a right and a wrong way of doing it. But I want to talk to you because when pastor asked me to speak, I, you know, I just want to make sure I hear from the Lord. And I'm just not sharing something to be sharing it. And I went to bed that night. And as soon as my head hit the pillow, I never was even thinking at that time, I heard Jude 4. So I got up and read Jude 4. And it says that there are some men who have crept in unaware. They've certain men, they crept in unnoticed. So anybody creeps in or doing that, we know they're sneaky, right? And so God was concerned about that. But as I looked at this, this congregation, this church he's writing to, uh, had people who come in. And he marked them as ungodly men who was turning God's grace into lewdness. And, he, and they were denying the Lord God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe the emphasis is on the Lord there. So who are these people? And what does that have to do with us today? And as I got to thinking about it, we might look it over, over to our right or left and say, it must be you, not me, it must be. But you know, I don't even think in the 21st century that it absolutely has to be someone sitting here with us, although it could be. But we have the television with teachers constantly we tune into. Do you know what they're teaching is true? We have worship songs and different songs that we listen to. There used to be Oprah. I thought she had her own little gospel going on. Talk about God. It sounded religious, but you needed to be careful. And I know a lot of people got caught up on things she was saying back in the day. 
And there's different things that we are now getting, the internet. While you're searching for information and learning about God, sometimes you can get some things. I find there's truth, and then there's just a little bit of something to get you off course. And I believe that's what these men at this time was doing, just a little bit. They come in, and it, that, that word says they came, for certain men have crept in unnoticed. When you go back and look at that, they use cunning words and clever deceptions, but it also means that they got in right alongside of them. They look just like Christians. They talk just like Christians. They act real religious. But this is the problem. Today in Christendom, we have Bible illiteracy. We don't think we have to study the word anymore. We don't think we need to know. But if there's ever a time in history, guys, you better know the word of God. You best know it. Because your very life and the life, our children and their children and their children depend upon us contending for the faith. It's got to be us. And so as I begin to look at this, they turned the grace of God into lewdness and denied the Lord. They turned the grace of God. You know what they do? It's, lewdness means lasciviousness in the King James. It's filthy. It's crude. It's offensive in a sexual way. It's vulgar, obscene, shameless conduct right in the midst of God's people. Don't think it don't happen. It comes to church every Sunday. They turn the grace of God into something shameful and dirty and sexual immorality, and they deny the Lord. You know, if somebody come in there and said, I don't believe Jesus is God or Lord, you and I, well, that'd be a red flag, would it not? We'd immediately know. I don't think they just did that. I think they denied that he was Lord, is Lord, by not not bowing down to him, not obeying him. Lord, Jerry Pester got into some of this last week. The first Lord, they denied the Lord God. That Lord, I, I'm not a Greek scholar, but here it goes. Dispotence, dispotence, something like that anyway. But what that means is supreme authority. God, supreme authority. And then the next Lord isn't the same one. The Lord Jesus Christ is curios. He's my master. He's the one I belong to. He's the one who rules over me. He has all supreme power. Do you understand that? And so therefore, here they come in and they're denying, oh, no, you don't have to do all that and still be a Christian. You, you're okay. Let me go on, and I'm going to get into this. I pray you hear the Father's heart and the love he has for us because he is for us. He is for us. They go on in verse 5, and he says, I want to remind you, though you once already knew this, you guys know these stories, he said. When God took the people, his people, out of the land of Egypt, and then he turned around and destroyed some because they didn't believe. Well, that just don't sound right. And then there was these angels in heaven, and they decided that they were going to rebel against God and follow Satan. And now it says that they are chained up in darkness waiting for the day of judgment. Do you see that? And then we have Sodom and Gomorrah. Now the gays and lesbians will tell you this has nothing to do with homosexuality, but it sounds it here and everywhere else you look and go back into it. There were other sins, but there was a lot of homosexuality and lesbianism and things going on. And so God had had enough. They turned themselves over to sexual immorality and God destroyed them. And it's an example for us of eternal fire. There is a hell. There is a hell. I remember in, in the Methodist before I got just right, it was after I got married, and I was hearing some of the preachers that were at that time, and I know they were learning in, in seminary, God is love, God is love, God is love, God is love, God loves you. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that's Jesus Christ, for you and I, and if we believe, we can be saved. But... God is also a God of judgment, and you need to understand that. See, God brought judgment on these people. 
The angels is a delayed judgment, but it's coming. Sodom and Gomorrah seems like it was quick and sudden. That's judgment. And so we might be walking in something and sin and think, oh, I'm getting by with it. God's all right. He loves me. Judgment will come if you continue in your sin. Don't tell me that. I know you people get tired of me talking about my family. And I don't always mean to. I love my daddy. I learned to love him and to forgive him. But I want you to know, I believe God's judgment upon him was also God's mercy upon him. It stopped his sin. It's not easy or fun to watch. But there are consequences to sin. Now, I want to go on. What what is telling us here? Is these kind of people reject authority? I'll talk about that here in a minute with others. Because they do. They don't like anybody over them. They want to be large and in charge. Don't that sound like Satan to you? And that's what he does with us in the flesh if we follow after him. Look at verse 11. Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and have run greedily into the era of Balaam for profit and perished in the rebellion of Korah. He gave us examples of groups of people. Now he's naming them individually of the judgment. Cain, what did Cain do? Well, we know he murdered his brother because God accepted Abel's sacrifice. And if you go back into the 11th chapter of Hebrew, you know it's by faith. By faith, God accepted Abraham's. So that tells me something. I think Cain come with his sacrifice. He had no faith. He, did, he was in unbelief. He was just doing it his way. This is what I think. He had quite a cocky attitude. I am going to worship God the way I want to worship God, and he better bless it. I like that song, The Blessing. I want to be blessed. I want my children and the children's children and and on blessed. But I can't be so cocky and say, God, you're going to do it my way. I've learned something. He is master. He is Lord. Not just my Savior. He saved me from my sin. But he has to be also Lord of your life. And I bow to him. And sometimes I don't like what I have to do. I don't like having to forgive that person who who has hurt me or hurt somebody I love. I don't like always doing those things. But I learned that's where the life is. That's where the blessing is, is in my obedience and my walk with God. I can't just do it my way and be sloppy about my walk. I, I homeschooled. And you've probably heard me talk about this. My little cousin was 10 years old and diagnosed with cancer. And he was in fifth grade that year. And I homeschooled him for that year. And he, his numbers were off. He couldn't go into school to take that last year of the end test. And I had to give it to him. And he was so excited that uh, he was going to take that test. And had he been at school, he probably couldn't answer all the questions. But because his teacher was right there with him and she loved him, is what he said, she was going to give him the answers. And I said, buddy, you got a special relationship with your teacher, and she loves you so much. But I want you to know this. What you know, praise God, mark it. What you don't know, you better take an educated guess because I ain't helping you. (laughs) See, this is what he was saying. I have such a special relationship with the teacher that the rules don't apply. Jesus loves me. Oh, well, God, I know I do that, but God loves me. (laughs) Yeah, he does. He loves you. And you need to listen to the warnings that he is giving us. He is announcing warnings today, again, everywhere you look. Because he loves you. And we have to walk in obedience. You think you're more special than someone else? I don't care if you've got a title you go by in the church. I don't care how anointed you may be. I'm going to look at some of these. Look at Cain. He thought he could just do it his way. And we know he murdered. And he could have. God told him. He told him, will you not be accepted if you offer the right sacrifice? What's he want? He wants our love and our heart. All of us. 
all of us. He doesn't want some pretty looking uh, thing. Now see, this would have been my problem. I'd been with Cain trying to fix my little fruit and veggies looking so pretty and bring them and thinking mine looks pretty in that bloody old sheep over there. But that's not what he's looking for. He wants obedience. He don't want a fine looking little Christian dressed Christianly, talking Christianly, walking That's not what he's wanting. He wants our heart and our obedience. But what happens when I slip up? I keep hearing somebody saying, I have too. I've slipped up. I really slip up when I try to do it on my own too. I'm a strong-willed individual. My family who lives with me knows this. (laughs) I can accomplish a lot on my own. But there comes a day and an hour when I meet something I can be doing so well and blow it and realize I've been standing on my own strength. I need to let Jesus Christ live in and through me. Because church, I'm going to get ahead of myself, but somebody needs to hear this. You can't do it on your own. He, never, he knows you can't do it on your own. But that don't give you the license to go do anything you want to do. In sin. Pastor has said for 20 some years I've been here. He loves you too much to leave you the way he found you. He is doing a work and change. You know that little song I learned back in Bible school? Happiness is to know the Savior. Living a life within his favor. Having a change in my behavior. Happiness is the Lord. Having a change, that was the theology back in the old days. Today, you don't have to change. You just ask Jesus into your heart, and you go your happy little way, skip through life. Oh, that's taken care of. I was uh, working with a man one time, and uh, I saw no signs of Christianity. And and so I started witnessing to him. And he said, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's been taken care of. He had said his sinner's prayer years ago, and he was all right with the Lord. Let me keep going to this next one, and I'll get into that. His name is Balaam. I think Pastor talked about Balaam here recently. Balaam was a prophet of God. And Balaam could hear God, and he could give the word of the Lord. Well, the king of Moab uh, had heard about the Israelites and how they attack, and he was concerned about that, and he, he wanted to try to... S- Uh, sever their power so it couldn't destroy them. So he hired Balaam, the prophet of God, to speak curses upon the people of of Israel, of God's people, that that would stop it. So Balaam apparently took the money because he tried to, uh, to prophesy curses, speak curses over God's people, and God would not allow him. He kept blessing, and he kept blessing, and he kept blessing because God's people are blessed. They are blessed. And the curses, I don't worry about that. People are cursing this because we live under the blessing of God. And so they were going through all that. But you know what? Uh, That didn't work. But Balaam said, I got a good idea. Oh, I got a good idea. And this one's going to work because we'll do it subtly and we'll do it quietly. And they're going to fall. God's people will fall. This is all numbers. Uh, starting with chapter 22, you go all the way through to 31, and you will see different parts of this story. I'm saving you from reading all that. Aren't you glad? But I find it's called the doctrine of Balaam. What was it? You see, the Israelites were covenant people of God. And so he, t- he told them, you, you're in a covenant with God, and that covenant cannot be broken. Can't be broken. So therefore, the Israelites, it's okay for you to sin. You have immunity because of your covenant with God. And basically, I'm, I'm, at, I'm paraphrasing, but that was his doctrine to them. Also, to eat the foods that were sacrificed to idols. What I found was wrong with that. When you go back into history in that time, they believed they would have had to go into those temples of false gods, of those idols, in order to eat of that food. And therefore, they also, to get the food, had to partake 
in the partake into the immoralities. So there was sexual sin going on. And what he told him to do, hey, bring those pretty girls, those Midianite women and those Moabite women in around the Hebrew boys, and they will get, have relations with them, and they will pull them away from God and weaken God's people because God is their strength. And that's exactly what they did. This is what his doctrine is. You're saved. You've been covered by the blood. I know you, I'm living in sin, but it's okay because, you know, I'm covered by the blood. Jesus loves me. And I'm seeing that everywhere today. And now I realize what doctrine it is. There's nothing new under the sun. It, it was going on back then. It's going on today. There are people preaching, you're all right with God. I'm all right. I know I'm not perfect. Listen, none of us are perfect. But this I know. He said, be ye holy, for I am holy. What do we do with that? There's a responsibility. I represent, I'm an ambassador for Jesus Christ. How can I represent the very Son of God, the Holy God, and live in sin? Do you hear God's heart? Because what he's trying to tell us. There is judgment for this kind of lifestyle. Balaam, as I started looking at Balaam, 2 Peter 2, 14 and 15 says this. Oh, well, let me go back to it because I don't have the first verse. 2 Peter 2. Why is it you can't get to pages to turn when you're in a hurry? 14 and 15. Here are people, he's talking about their eyes are full of adultery. Then that cannot cease from sin. They can't keep themselves from sinning. And they entice unstable souls. They have a heart trained in covetous practices and are accursed children. They have forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the way of Balaam, son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. God used a dumb donkey to try to speak to him. I asked God to use this dumb donkey this morning to try to warn somebody this morning that God is saying to you that you cannot continue in sin and have a walk with him. You have bought a lie if you think that you are saved and walking with him and continuing in sin. Let me tell you what this is. Revelations 2.6, Jesus said this to uh, the church of Ephesus, that they hated the practices of Nicolaitans, which was good, because he hated their practice too. What was their practice? The doctrine of the Nicolaitans was that it was, this is summarized, it was all right to have one foot in both worlds. I'm going to serve God, and I'm going to enjoy the stuff of the world. A double-binded man is unstable. In all of his ways. They encouraged worldly participation. They encouraged the people to indulge in sin. And let me tell you, this lowers the godly standard. Why is it today that we have churches, the world mocks and makes fun of us because they see the same sin in us as they see that's out there. And they say, There's, this God has made no difference. This doctrine of Balaam that says you can live however you want to live and God still know God. I want you to know this is personal to me. I have a nephew that is now known as a girl. He is in, I won't call him she, he is in a school of theology. The school of theology is helping these people to transgender and find and fulfill their call in Lord Jesus Christ. You think it's not going on? You think it's not going to touch your life? It's all around us, people. And it's alive from the pits of hell. And people are thinking they're right with God. And they're going to split hell wide open. And we've got to warn them. We've got to tell them. They won't like it. They don't like it. I've been unfriended. I don't get Christmas cards anymore. I, none of those things. I was told to leave it alone. Not to say anything by their father. And I said, but I got to. 
because I love you. And if I don't tell you your blood is on my hands, I've got to tell you the truth of God's Word. He didn't clap me. I want you to know that. <laughs> but I did it in love. And I said, I want you to know I love you. I'll love you forever and for always. Nothing will change that. But I know who I am in Christ Jesus. I can't go by the pronoun that they want to be called. I can't call them that name because to me it's a lying, deceiving spirit that is destroyed. I think it's Satan's, this is how I see it. it, it well, it's Satan trying to be God. You created them there? Watch me create and destroying their life. They're so happy right now. They weren't happy as a guy, but, oh, but he's so happy now. No, he's not. It won't last. It won't last. And you'll need Jesus, the real and living Jesus. And the one that they hate right now, they may come back to and say, hey, I need your help. So we keep loving them and we tell them the truth. If they see me standing here saying this about God and then I change my stance to like a chameleon to try to get along with everybody and fit in, they see a wishy-washy person. They got to know you're standing firm. They call you full of hate. Christianity is called hate speech right now. You're a hated people. But God... But God, we have to tell them the truth. That's Balaam. That's the Nicolaitans. The world of compromise. Do it my way. Cain. And God's going to bless it. It's okay. I can live however. That's not Lord. That's not God, Jesus Christ, being Lord over your life. And so that admonition, we've seen it growing. In the, uh, the early church, do you know that they battled some of the same things made worse than what we know at this point? Do you remember that fire in Rome in AD 64 that burned for six days or six, six nights and seven days, I think it was? And Nero, the emperor, who would have been there around Paul's time, blamed the, the Christians for it falsely. And then he began to torture them. Do you know that he offered his gardens to do these things in? They covered these Christians with wild beast hides and threw them to the dogs to let them wallow and chew on them. They nailed them to crosses. They set fire to them. And whenever the night came, that fire was used to light his gardens of a night. You think it's, it's bad yet? We have to take a stand. And they stood. Listen to 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 4. I'm going to read it to you out of the New Living Translation. You should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times. For people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred, nothing's holy. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and they hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless. That means they don't care about any consequences. They're reckless and be puffed up with pride and love pleasure rather than God. I don't know about you, but when you turn on the evening news, does that not kind of sound like that to you? We're living in such a time as that. People don't care about consequences. It doesn't matter to them. You, you can't talk to them anymore. They're so full of themselves. And so I feel like the rule books are being written. What was good is now said to be evil. And what was evil is great. And so we've got to take a stand. And then in the church, Timothy, Paul is telling Timothy, there's trouble in the church. What first Timothy 4, 1. Now the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last days, some will turn away from true faith. They will follow deceptive spirits and teachings that come from demons. I'm sorry, but a lot of this stuff that's going down today is nothing but demonic. Nothing but demonic. And so we got to stand for truth. Here's 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 and 4. 
Chapter 4, 3, and 4, New Living Translation. For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who would tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. You see this so-called theology school? People are, have those itching ears. They'll accommodate me. Oh, they're going to help me. And they applaud me. Why goodness, they had my nephew a party for his coming out, for his beautiful girl look, crown on his head. I think he has mental issues to begin with. And then we go through all this. And we applaud it. You can find somebody to justify whatever sin you want to live in. And call it God. I can take scriptures out of this Bible and justify whatever I want. That's what they do. And they twist it. Satan has always quoted scripture. You better know the truth. Do you know it? Quickly. I'm trying to hurry. Within the church back in 2005, they did a research, this, these uh, people, uh, Christian Smith and Melinda Denton. And they were looking at... Uh, Teenage Christians, they found out as the, the survey they did, teens were not spiritual seekers. They were very comfortable and at home in church, but they were not spiritual seekers. Another thing that they found, which I is, is terrible, almost none from any religious background could articulate the most basic beliefs of the faith. Just basic beliefs. They were not able to tell them anything of that. This is what they come up with. These surveyors said they summed up their, these teens' theology as moralistic, therapeutic deism. In other words, to the teens, religion was about being nice and enjoying a relationship with God who mostly wanted them to be happy and feel good about themselves. First of all, People say, church failed. Let me go back. Parents have failed to take time to instruct their own children. I remember as a child sitting in our living room. Daddy was a pastor. He had church almost every night. If he couldn't be there, mom did. And we were taught scriptures. I, could, I knew them. I could quote them. I didn't always know God the way I should. Because I was in the midst. I remember being with a group after I first got saved. A group of women probably in their 40s. I thought they were ancient. I know what 18-year-olds think I am now. <laughs> but I thought, they're so dumb. They don't know nothing. I've been taught the word. But I heard the Lord speak to me. And he called me by my name. Pam, you know a lot about me. But do you really know me? I want to ask you that. You're hearing a lot about God when you come here. You can hear it. You can know it. But if you don't live it and apply it and have a relationship yourself with Jesus Christ, where the Bible says, my sheep know my voice and they follow no other. I had a woman to come and she was supposed to be a prophet, speak over my life. And it just about ripped me apart. And I kept saying something inside, God doesn't talk to me like that. God doesn't talk to me like that. My sheep know my voice. Do you know his voice? Is he Lord over your life? Is he your master? Not just Savior from your sins by his blood. Thank you, Jesus. But now I have to make him Lord over my life. I can't live like Balaam. I can't be like Korah who rebelled against the authority of God's, the authority God lifted up, which was Moses and Aaron. And he said, why, who do you think you are to be Lord over us, to be authority over us? We know as much about God as you do. Pastor Jerry, why are you doing that? I know as much as you do. Because God has a line of authority. And it doesn't mean anybody's any better than anybody else. It's just the assigned places God puts us. 
No matter where it is, do it all unto the Lord. Be faithful to it because that's where your rewards will be. Not trying to take somebody else's position. I'm getting close. Amen. So what do we do about this contending? They're grumblers, complainers. I won't get into all that, but that's what they do. They mock. They're ungodly. They don't have the spirit of God. But I want uh, to read this part to you. Verse 20 through 22, and I'm in the new King James. But you, beloved, build yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost or Spirit and keeping yourself in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's how we contend the faith. Say what? Yes. What I feel he's saying, build yourself up on your most holy faith. I think get into the word of God. Begin to study it and find out who you are in Christ Jesus. Learn who God is. Learn how he talks. Learn his heart. Spend time with him. Pray in the Holy Spirit. Be led by the Holy Ghost. If you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, pray in tongues. Find the Lord and say, Holy Spirit, pray through me. Work through me. Let me see. Talk to me. And we do those things. And he says, keep yourself in the love of God. You know that word keep there is the exact same word that I read in verse 1. To those who are called, sanctified, that's set apart for God, and preserved in Jesus. That word preserved means keep, means to guard, to attend carefully to. And so he's saying guard and keep yourself carefully in the love, the agape love of God. How do I do that? By walking in him. He's my covering. He's the one that I stay with. If I go out from underneath him, I'm out under from his protection and his blessing. I want to walk in him. And I keep myself there. That's the part uh, of that. And in 2 Timothy 3, 14 and 17, the New American Standard, Paul tells him, Timothy, this is what you do. You, however, continue. Continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you've learned them. He was taught them from the child. He learned them. It gave him wisdom that led him to salvation. All scripture is, is God-inspired, beneficial for teaching, for rebuke, for correction, for training, for righteousness, so that the man of God may be fully capable, equipped with every good work. Do you know that the word says that we were saved unto good works? We're supposed to be doing good work. If you're shacking up with somebody, you're in sin. If you're abusing uh, addictions, alcohol, and drugs, and smoking that weed, and thinking you're okay and representing Jesus, I believe you're in sin. If I'm full of jealousy of Pam's beautiful voice, and I am. (laughs) I love her and appreciate her. But if we're full of jealousy, it will lead you to sin. If I'm unforgiving, I could live in unforgiveness and I could tell you the reason why. And you would say, I understand. It's all right, honey. But it's not. Lord Jesus forgave me. I have to forgive. You're in sin. There's all, there's different ways of sinning. Covetousness. Seeking after wrong things trying to satisfy something inside only God can do. You've got to understand, we cannot have one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom of God. It's not a place to straddle. You're either or. I say this, choose life that you and your household will live. Choose Jesus Christ. Make him Lord over your life. Your master, the one you bow to, Oh, but my life will be so hard and harsh and boring. You, you don't know. He's such a blessing. He will bless you. He will fulfill you. He is so good all the time. And he goes on in 22 and 23, tells you to reach out for those who are getting caught up in these types of sins and this type of teaching and doctrine. Some you do it with compassion and softness. Others, you have to grab them like you're grabbing them out of fire. But watch yourself that you're not so full of yourself that you get stumbled up to. Timothy said in second, or Paul said to Timothy in second, 
Uh, Timothy 2, 2, the things which you have heard from me among witnesses, entrust or commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others. I believe we contend for the faith by studying and walking and living them and teaching them. We instruct others and we help them. So when we, this generation's gone, the other generation's going to stand up and take that baton, standing, contending for the truth of the word of God. The truth shall set you free. Is that not what it says? I want to end with the last few verses because I've looked at this. My daddy, if nobody could walk the Christian life, I thought nobody could if he couldn't do it. And he fell, and he fell big, and it made a big mess that is still You can feel and see repercussions from it today. I'm thankful for the cross and the blood of Jesus. But I want you to know that the devil spoke to me after I got married because I knew I had to get my life in line with the Lord Jesus Christ. But I heard something say, you're going to be just like your dad and you're going to fall. You just don't even bother because you'll cause other people to fall too. Doesn't that sound so caring and religious? But I found this verse, these verses, 24 in uh, Jude, now to whom him who is able to keep you from falling. Well, that man, that godly person fell. Well, they slipped in letting him be Lord over their life. And you know what? A righteous man falls seven times, but the Lord will lift him back up. Just because you fall don't mean it's over. Honey, jump back up, get cleansed by the blood of Jesus, and keep going. We all fall. We all fall. We're like babies learning to walk in the Lord and his ways, and his ways are not our ways. And so we're a little shaky, a little bit, and we might fall. And they say, oh, look at them. They're a Christian. I don't, who cares what they say? Get back up, show them you mean business with Jesus, and you're going to keep walking. And guess what? You're going to get stronger. Your legs are going to be seaworthy. You're going to walk on those stormy waters and glorify Jesus. Don't stop. What did they tell us to do? To keep continuing on. Keep on keeping on in what you know is right and what you know to do. Nobody is judging you that, oh, they messed up. We all do. We all do. But you know what? If you truly love Jesus, you don't stay there. You can't be comfortable in sin. You can't live it there forever. The peace of God, something happens inside. Oh, it's an awful feeling. And the Holy Spirit's working with you, and you know you got to get it right. And so he says, girl, get up. (laughs) Wash that stuff off your face, and let's go. And let's go. And so what do we got to be real and open? You know, when all this was going on in my life, I thought everybody, Christians were perfect. I did. I thought they were supposed to be perfect. And I couldn't. I just couldn't do it, no matter. I couldn't do it. But the Holy Spirit, when I got baptized in the Holy Ghost, something happened to me. He put a strength and a want to. A want to. I don't want to sin. I don't want to go out there and do that anymore. I don't have to have that anymore. God, I need you in my life. I need you. That's what he's asking. So the heart of this message of contending for the faith, get into your word. Talk to him. Praying is just talking to him. God, the sun is so pretty today. Thank you. God, I'm concerned about this. God, I've cried my eyes out about that. God, I need you here. I appreciate you. I thank you for your love and your mercy. He loves you. He's for you. And he wants to bless you and your children and your children's children. That was so anointed this morning. So anointed. We love you. We want to see you in the kingdom of heaven, in a heaven someday, every one of you, where we will rejoice in him. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you are faithful when I am not. I thank you that you love me so much that you can't leave me, you won't leave me in my sin, but you'll deal with me, you'll warn me so that judgment doesn't have to come. I watched judgment upon my daddy. 
It was brain damage and a heart attack and all these things. It was awful, God. I don't want my friends to go through this, Lord. I ask God that you will raise them up on their feet, on firm foundation on you, Jesus, that rock that will never let them down, that you will teach them your ways and guide their footsteps always, that you'll give them a a hunger, a hunger for you, God, a thirst for you that only you can satisfy. God, that you'll mark each and every one of these people, their households for your glory. The enemy cannot have them, Lord. They belong to you. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus, Jesus' mighty name, amen. The altars are open. If you want prayer, prayer for somebody, please come. I'm sorry.
to a